inflation. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, annual rate of headline inflation are likely to hover around the current level for the remainder of the year. While measures of underlying inflation remain generally muted, they have been increasing from earlier lows. Domestic cost pressures are strengthening and broadening amid high levels of capacity utilization and tightening labor markets. Uncertainty around the inflation output is receding. Looking ahead, underlying inflation is expected to pick up towards the end of the year and thereafter to increase gradually over 
over the medium term. Supported by our monetary policy measures, the continuing economic expansion, the corresponding absorption of economic slack, and rising wage growth. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money, M3, growth increased to 4.4% in June 2018, up from 4 percent in May. And three growth continues to benefit from the impact of the ECB's monetary policy measures and the low opportunity cost of holding the most liquid deposits. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 remained the main contributor to broad money growth. The recovery in the growth of loans to the private sector observed since the beginning of 2014 is proceeding. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations rose to 4.1% in June 2018 after 3.7% in the previous month, while the annual growth rate of loans to households remained unchanged at 2.9%. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the second quarter of 2018 indicates that loan growth continues to be supported by easing credit standards and increasing demand across all loan categories. The pass-through of the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continues to significantly support borrowing conditions for firms and households, access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises and credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels so that, that are right, below we'll but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising, to raising the longer term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms in euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost euro area productivity and growth potential. Regarding fiscal policies, the ongoing broad-based expansion calls for rebuilding fiscal buffers. This is particularly important in countries where government debt remains high. All countries will benefit from intensifying efforts towards achieving a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. A full, transparent and consistent implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact and of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure over time and across countries remains essential to increase the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the functioning of the economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council urges specific and decisive steps to complete the banking union and the capital markets union. And we are now at your disposal for questions. From Reuters. Uh, Mr. Draghi, in the assessment you just presented, did you have a chance uh, to review the agreements struck between the EU Commission President and uh, the US President overnight with regard to trade? And is this assessment um, only regarding sentiment, regarding protectionism, or are you seeing an actual impact uh, on growth already materializing? The second question is about. Um, did you discuss question? Uh, did you discuss your reinvestment policy today? And if so, could you give us any kind of color about this discussion? What decisions need to be made? And, what, and when should we expect a decision on reinvestment policy? Thank you. Uh, well, on the first question, really, we took we basically took two of that. We, we, it's too early to assess the actual content. I understand that today, this afternoon, the Commission 
is having a meeting exactly for this uh, for this reason. Uh, so we, we took note of this uh, of this uh, meeting, and uh, if one can say sort of something is kind of general, it's a good sign. It's a good sign because it's, in a sense it, it shows that uh, it shows that uh, there is a willingness to discuss trade issues in a multilateral framework again. Uh, but it would be very it would be difficult for us to go beyond that because we really don't need the substance of it. Uh, no, we didn't discuss the investment. surveys, market commentary, and market prices in aligned expectations of the future rate path with the anticipations of the governing council. So at this stage, we don't see the need to modify or to add new language to our forward guidance on rates. Now, on the second question, um, different monetary policies do reflect the response of monetary authorities to different positions in the business cycle. There's no, we, we, we will say, we said several times that the exchange rate is not a policy target, that it's important for growth and price stability, and there is an international consensus that's been going on now for years, uh, for decades perhaps, about uh, abstaining from competitive valuations of the world of sorts. So it's, um, that's, that's, the, that's the answer. Incidentally, if one looks at the nominal effective exchange rate of the euro vis-à-vis -vis all the partners, all the trading partners, as a matter of fact, the euro has appreciated considerably over the last year, year and a half. This is for the next day. Uh, Mr. President, I have a question again about the impact of protectionism. Um, you obviously mentioned that you take note of, of the agreement, but also in your um, account of the last meeting you said that the impact on, on inflation from potential protectionist measures could be, is ambiguous and certain. Have you uh, took uh, like a deeper look into it? I mean, you have all the answers of Second question, I know that you mentioned you can discuss on investment policies, but could you give us a broad outline on, on sort of your red lines where um, the investment policies won't change um, in the second phase when you have a second phase? Thank you. Uh, on protectionism, uh, no, we, we haven't done any further analysis than I, I, I have outlined last time. Uh, and, and, and the reason is that uh, we basically have to see exactly what's going to be implemented. We've seen and we have analyzed uh, the implemented, the effects of implemented tariffs, and we, as I said last time, the direct effects are, are limited. Uh, 
but clearly uh, the uh, it, it, it trade war where you have uh, rounds of retaliation and rounds of responses will create an entirely different climate and uh, we will have to assess both the direct effects which may be significant as the numbers significantly go up and the indirect effects of confidence on, especially on, on business investments and uh, that is uh, that is uh, we, we haven't done anything different from last time yet so we'll have to assess in the future now on the reinvestment we haven't discussed it uh, but silly just to make it clear the capital key remains uh, our anchor in what we do on investments just to clear the slate from any, any doubt um, that's it looking at the current uh, earnings season um, so what makes you still so optimistic uh, second question would be on whether they're given the already char the, the inflation rate being back, back, back at your target whether there's an increasing sort of discussion inside the governing council uh, among the members of course um, that is perhaps yeah time to even um, decrease the monetary stimulus in place. Thank you. Let me uh, just, uh, the best way to answer both questions is to give you a short account of what's been our discussion today. Uh, well, first of all, um, the Governing Council took stance to note that there hasn't been much of a change since last time. Has not been a change in the assessment of the outlook, of the medium term outlook for growth or inflation, nor in a change in the monetary policy message. Uh, but the first point is that um, it, it's now clearer than it was before that the moderation in growth, and here I'm addressing the first question, depends essentially on the pullback from the unusually strong growth rates that we've seen in the first, in the last three quarters last year, which were caused by, predominantly by, a, an unusually strong uh, export performance. And, uh, and so now the, um, there's a pullback and the export performance is much less uh, strong than, than it was before. Some sluggishness, sluggishness of in the first quarter is continuing in the second quarter, but I would say all, of most, almost all indicators have now stabilized at the levels that are above historical averages. The, uh, so the overall the risks to growth have been uh, assessed as still broadly balanced. Financing conditions remain stable and the labor market continues to improve, thereby supporting private consumption. Also the uh, accommodative monetary policy and the resulting uh, uh, financing conditions do support private investment as we can see from, from the figures. Now on inflation, and here I'm coming to the other point of your question, uh, it's, uh, it's true the headline inflation is now 2% from 1.9, but if you look at the inflation, uh, so the, the next question that you ask is, and one should ask is, is this going to be sustained? And the answer is that if we look at inflation excluding oil and food, it's now 0.9 from 1.1 last time. And the underlying inflation remains muted. So we see encouraging sign here and there. It's very early to call victory. Um, now, one positive development is the nominal wage performance where, you remember, we've we, we seen a pickup in nominal wage growth, 
across the Eurozone. But uh, until recently, this, uh, this, this pickup was mostly produced by wage drift. While, uh, while now we are seeing that there is a, a, a component, which is the negotiated wage component, which is now, right now, the main driver of the growth in nominal wages. So the conclusion was that the assessment of confidence that we expressed in Riga about convergence of inflation to our objective is still warranted. But an ample degree of monetary accommodation remains necessary and therefore we got to be prudence, patience and persistence are going to still going to be the key words that uh, inform, inspire our monetary policy. Mr. Draghi, um, two questions if I may. Let's just to touch on the point that you made about wages being a lot stronger than people maybe would have thought at the start of the year and it's in better negotiated pay deals. Um, I'd like your view on how you think this will impact domestic demand. Is it going to have an impact on domestic demand that's strong enough to offset the negative effects that we've seen of weaker trade figures? Or would you still expect to see some slowdown in growth in the second half of this year? Um, and secondly, some people have said there's a little bit too much ambiguity about the phrase through the summer and the changes to some of the translations of the monetary policy statement have, have raised these issues again. So would you care to clarify just what is meant by through the summer? Is it at least until the end of the summer when rates are expected to remain on hold until? Or is it at least until the summer of next year? Thank you. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'll address first the second question. Uh, first of all, let me clear that the only version that conveys the policy message is the English version. And uh, we conduct our governing council in English and agree on an English text. So, um, that's what we have to look at. The, um, now, on, uh, on the, as you see, the term structure of money market rates uh, reflects, the, reflects two things. Reflects the pure expectations of the future path of the policy rates, uh, but reflects also the uncertainty that surrounds the evolution of the economy. So, as far as, um, as I think I said last time, as far as uh, pure expectations are concerned, they are very well aligned with the anticipation of the governing council. The policy rates will remain at their current levels through the summer of next year. And, um, but surveys of market views and surveys of market views confirm this, uh, this uh, very tight alignment. Then you have the uncertainty component uh, in the term structure. This, of course, uh, the, tends to be more variable and shifts with misperceptions. And what we see is that this component now may have increased since our June announcement due to various factors, including the state of the debate on trade. So now let me, uh, let me now address the first part of the question about whether we can see a, an impact coming from higher nominal wage growth that will compensate trade. We do, I mean frankly we haven't done this analysis yet, uh, but we do see growth rates stabilizing at this uh, level which is uh, actually pretty good for the Eurozone after this unusual performance in, uh, in, uh, in exports. So we do expect the second part of this year to continue being on, uh, on solid growth, growth based across sectors and across countries. Pussy, 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 pussy. Master, let's master. Wait, wait. Nicholas Moster from ZDF, um, uh, Mr. Draghi, a question about the Target 2 system. How do you rate the risk of this um, system, especially for the Bundesbank and also in compared to the uh, National Bank? Tell me about it. Now, first of all, let me make a general point. Target 2 is uh, a payment system. As such, it doesn't generate instability. It's the way in which a monetary union 
settles its payments and its device to make sure the money flows unencumbered across countries, individual sectors, companies, uh, all economic agents. So that's the first uh, thing that we should always keep in mind. The, the second thing is uh, how we interpret recent numbers to show an increased number of uh, target liabilities of certain countries. Well, this again is a question that was asked several times in the past. Most of the movement in target two liabilities depends on our own asset purchase program and depends on how and where, especially where, the balances of the purchases of bonds are settled. Uh, about 50% of the institutions, at least this was a number to the few months ago, but it's still valid. 50% of the institutions that sell bonds to the uh, national central banks are not in the euro area and settle their account with one or two core countries where the financial centers uh, uh, reside. So in this sense, you see that the accounting and settlement of the balances do depend on where the settlement is made. It's nothing to do with capital flows from one country or another. This is by, and just keep in mind, 80% of the institutions that sell banks, namely, that sell bonds to the national central banks, do not reside in the country where the national, with the purchaser, national central bank resides. So you have a lot of intra-country payments and flows that, uh, that do not say anything very specific about the, the overall situation. But going back to the recent movements in the liabilities of certain countries, you see that first of all they are, uh, they are not unprecedented. It's not the first time. We've seen, we've seen uh, movements as large or even larger in the past. The second, as a consequence of what I just said, they are a second order with respect to the massive movements produced by our own uh, purchase program. So the bottom line is the system is uh, works very well. Uh, the ones, uh, the, the people who want to cap it, collateralize, move it. I mean, the truth is that they don't like the euro. They don't like the monetary union because the only way a monetary union can work is if they have an efficient payment system, which is what Target Two is. And uh, and I think it's just too early to understand exactly what part of the trade of the liabilities do reflect political certainty. of the capital key uh, next year it's due and uh, you can easily compute something like those countries which have had more growth in the past they will have a bigger share of the capital than in the future. What implications would this have for the reinvestment or would this affect the reinvestment of, of bonds? I'm sorry we haven't discussed that at all. So I can't answer this question. Well, I, we actually haven't discussed anything about investment policy. But you can have a question if you
central bank it's true what you said has a very different uh, and uh, much much richer set of monetary policy tools and uh, so that is uh, this is important uh, but the key the, 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 the real reason for uh, for the Saudi council to be to be proud is that it has the limit price to pay it has the limit price to pay Of a great depression, as 
So why didn't you discuss it today? Is the governing council not wasting time uh, when it comes to, to deciding on how we invest funds? And related to that, very general, should we, see, should we see reinvestment as a pure technical process or is it something that could also be used to give a monetary, an additional monetary impulse? Um, and the second one is on, on, on the future of uh, your monetary policy. The account of the Green meeting said that um, the uh, forward guidance would be the tool of choice for adjusting the monetary policy stance in the future. Does that mean if the outlook worsens, um, especially on inflation, uh, the preferred option would be to change the forward guidance and rates uh, instead of changing uh, the QE uh, outlook, meaning extending QE again? Thank you. Thank you. I'll answer the second question because the first question has a quick answer. We haven't discussed it. So, um, and we haven't discussed it even when to discuss it. Uh, uh, but the second question is, as you've seen, as I uh, stressed in, uh, in, um, in the last uh, Riga Monetary Policy Council, uh, the, all the, all the um, statement, the introductory statement, all the, the formulation of all the monetary policy tools contain a repeated optionality and flexibility, uh, putting the governing council in an ideal position to uh, react to uh, events. Some of these events are part of a foreseeable future based on the current set of information. Some other events may well not be foreseeable at the present time, but we don't want to exclude the possibility that they may happen. And that's why we retain a high degree of optionality. Thank you. Looking around. For the summer break, then. Any other questions? Yeah, you like that. Then we close the press conference. Just a moment. Let yes. me let me do let me say something that I, I should have said at the very beginning. Uh, we are actually witnessing a, 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 a drama of uh, uh, a tragic drama of spectacular proportions in Greece. Just want to express uh, the solidarity and the closeness of the governing council members uh, to the Greek people on this occasion. Thank you. An early start to the ECB news conference and an early finish as well for President Mario Draghi. Operation get to the summer vacation, I think, for him. In a market, this is how we shape up for you. Let's begin with a price action in the euro. Euro dollar shaping up as follows in the FX market. Euro was a little bit stronger as Mario Draghi showed a little bit more conviction around the inflation story. Then that quickly rolled over as he's pretty much said it's too early to declare victory. The euro softer here, down by a third of 1% at 116.92. Amid a uh, stronger dollar story across most of G10. If you switch up the board and just get to the bond market, you did see a bid coming to the bond market too for German bonds. Yields on German bonds just rolling over a little bit. On a 10-year government bond right now in Germany, the yield is 40 basis points and positive on the session by about a basis point. But you see that rollover as the news conference rolled on. And just to get you up to speed on US futures, the story shaping up as follows. Negative 5 on the S&P 500. NASDAQ 100 futures really weighed down by what is happening with Facebook. Facebook down by 22% in the pre-market. Nasdaq futures down by three quarters of 1%. So the ECB keeping rates unchanged, sticking to its plan to end bond purchases, but Mario Draghi saying he's keeping an eye on the EU's trade spat with the United States. 
While uncertainties, notably related to the global trade environment, remain prominent, the information available since our last monetary policy meeting indicates that the euro area economy is proceeding along a solid and broad-based growth path. They joined me around the table here in New York City. I'm pleased to say it's Matt Toms, Voyer Investment Management CIO for Fixed Income and Alessio De Longis Oppenheimer Funds Portfolio Manager. Alessio, what does it say about the state of affairs? The President Draghi basically has a market debating over how to define summer, and not this summer, but next summer of 2019. Well, Draghi has, and policymakers in general globally have managed to really deliver what they wanted, which was a very stable and predictable uh, monetary policy outcome. They wanted to remove all sorts of uncertainty around exit strategies. Remember, when we got into these extraordinary policy measures, the key message attached to them was the management of long-run expectations around the unwinding of those extraordinary policies. They know they have fired all the bullets, the entire arsenal that they have. And all it takes is miscommunication around the forward-looking component to unwind all that dramatic effort. So they have succeeded in doing so. And, um, and I think we, uh, we are going to have to wait. Now, the part that, the part that is, I'm struggling with is how can you be uh, providing forward guide, a calendar-based forward guidance for the first time ever, and at the same time reiterate a message of data dependency. Uh, the two are not entirely consistent for me. Uh, someone just messaged me and said, I'm pretty sure he defined the summer of 2018 as 9.10 Eastern time um, this morning. <laughs> it just seemed like he wanted to get away, Matt. Uh, yeah, fair enough. But look, extraordinary measures do whatever it takes. We have to do whatever it takes to get out as well. So yeah. um, they, they don't really have this figured out yet. The Fed had a path um, that they laid out, which was autopilot. And now I think the ECB still has to define that path. But I agree with Alessio. They're not quite sure if they're data dependent yet or they need a path. They need a signal if there's an end game, if there's a primary landing point. And they've done nothing to do that yet. And they need to communicate a new chairman next year. A lot of work to do. Matt, it's not too difficult to sit here and actually conclude and make a really strong argument that Europe might have seen its highest rate of growth in this cycle. Yet the rate has not moved an inch and is not going to until perhaps the back end of next year. Are we seeing the ingredients here, a recipe for a policy error from the European Central Bank? Short answer, yes, absolutely. Um, ultimately, the ECB and global central banks at large have waited much too long and are trying to prop the upside to growth when really what you have is a productivity dilemma that you're fighting. So they're avoiding the downside protection in the next cycle. The markets don't care that much about it today, yeah. but eventually these are chips that will be much no. more valuable to provide downside protection no. in the future. And Alessia, yeah, they could probably sit here and say, look, we're back towards target on headline inflation. This is the right policy setting. Why is this the right policy setting? From their perspective, in the, the, in the inflation targeting world that we live in, their job is very clear and very simple. And Draghi is always very committed to reiterating that simple message. They sit there and they see their own forecast for inflation in the two, three year time around, close to 2%, but below 2%, assuming they implement all their, uh, their projected policy measures. So, by definition, it's a chicken and egg problem, right? By definition, they, they, their own forecasts are telling them we shouldn't move. We should continue to deliver what we, what we yeah. have promised to deliver. The challenge with that is that we can then go back when the next cycle will be, when this cycle will be over. How do we go back and blame them for having built excessive leverage in the system in other parts of the economy? That's what we did with the Federal Reserve. The problem is, if you do inflation targeting, and that's your strict mandate. There are, there's all sorts of side effects to the economy. And it's the state of the world. It's the way it is. The question is, is inflation targeting still today the right framework for monetary policy? Is it? I, 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 I start to question that. In a world where we start talking about nominal GDP targeting, and, and why are we talking about nominal GDP? Because we are in that problem. Max Evolver. Uh, financial stability becomes a part of that. And financial stability, if you under uh, prioritize that, eventually will lead to more deflationary risk longer term for overstimulating now. So the answer is, is fine, but you need to take a longer term perspective and realize you're increasing the downside risk as opposed to dampening the volatility of growth, which is the primary job. And the Federal Reserve is exploring the very same tension, although at a very different point in terms of their policy of normalization, if we can call this a policy of normalization. I'm just wondering when we get the whiplash. You're both in the bond market. I've got a bond curve that's negative all the way out to six years.
Surely at some point, whiplash is just around the corner, Matt. Uh, they control it, right? So the problem is if they create whiplash, um, and this is a slow-moving train wreck, um, the reverberations back into the, the, the safety of the boom market and the treasury market forestall something being too quick. You're more likely to see that whiplash in, in, in more like the Italian or the peripheral bond market. So how does this shape your view on what is happening or what is about to happen in the periphery and in the core? Um, well, ultimately, I think why they're being so slow is fear of the periphery and the core. They're not acting for the core of the European uh, economy. They're acting for the periphery. I think that's guiding the slowness, and it helps them in the near term. I actually think that's a tailwind the peripheral spreads over the next six months. So that's it. How are you managing your exposure to the European bond market right now? Um, so we actually uh, like, the, despite the negative yields, the reality is that from a U.S. bond investor perspective, um, a hedged exposure to some of these curves, the Japanese curve or the, or of the European curve, it actually ends up giving you um, attractive yields comparable or even higher than trading yields. So we, we have a neutral sense on European, on European bonds, uh, on European bonds in general as yellow bonds, and the idea there is very simple. We're not harvesting negative yields per se. From a global hedge bond perspective, um, it's still attractive to own duration in Europe, particularly if you start moving up selectively in some of the spreads, uh, including Italy or France or Spain, uh, now that the political turmoil has receded. Well, let's talk about one of the spreads that a lot of people are focused on. It's the US versus Germany. It's 10-year bonds versus 10-year treasuries with a spread of north of 250 basis points. Now, I've spent a lot of time having a lot of discussions about why that spread can't get much wider than it does. How do you see that evolving through the rest of 2018? So we see the highest probability is for that to inch higher, um, further higher, which is a, a somewhat non-consensus view. Many have, have, have called that reversal. However, if there's going to be a dramatic move, the dramatic move could be a move tighter. And looking for those asymmetries is a good way to make money in tough markets. So calling the direction is tough, but if you were to put in place a, a strategy that could win a little bit in a widening, but buy out of the money calls on that lower, that's a nice way to make money in all markets. A nice way to make money as well, looking at the shape of the U.S. Treasury curve may well be looking for a steep yeah. Is well, that what you're looking for too? We are, so a non-consensus call. We think the Fed, once they get to a neutral rate, we think they get there this year. Their response function changes from a set course to get to neutral to very data dependent. Interesting. And as that happens, they can let the yield curve steep. And I think Powell will take much more of a market approach and less of an academic. So you're looking for a mid-1990s type scenario where we flatten, 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 don't and, uh, and then start to steepen a little bit. Absolutely. Do you see that as well, Alessio? Similarly, yes. We think, especially in the US, the trend is still for flattening and, and then eventually um, a, a moderate steepening. We do believe that the yield curve inversion will take place. Now, on the on the uh, uh, Germany-US spread, yeah. uh, it's important to understand that while it is very attractive to uh, uh, it, it is very attractive to go the other way, and however, the trend is clearly for the current widening on a spot basis to continue. But it's very difficult at this stage to make many, uh, make any money off of it because so much is priced in. Over 50 basis points of extra widening in the two year is priced in. It's very difficult to at this point capitalize on a view that is consensus and probably the right view. President Draghi is a man that's used to coming under political pressure. He's used to looking down at Canberra and defending central bank independence. Are you expecting Chair Powell to do the same anytime soon, man? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Chair Powell doesn't back down from anybody, and I think that he'll defend the independence of the Fed. Let's see. Absolutely. No question. How will it result in policy? Do you think it's more pressure to hike instead of hold in one of those sort of finely balanced meetings? Uh, I think they ignore the political pressure. Look, per political pressure always exists. Um, and we just see it for the, through a more verbal executive branch today. Let's see. I completely agree. I, I think that when they're sitting there, they have so much information to review and they're so disciplined about it that these type of things do not influence their, their approach for yourself. Guys, it's been great to catch up with this morning to get the reaction to that ECB news conference and a look ahead to Federal Reserve policy as well. To Matt Holmes of Voyer Investment Management and Alessio De Longis of Oppenheimer Funds, thank you very much. Coming up on this program, Facebook's grim forecast. Disappointing results amid growing privacy concerns, sending shares sharply lower. We are down by over 21%. Earlier this week, I caught up with Brian Weezer. He said, I'm right, the market's wrong. That's why he had a sell on this stock. I'll be catching up with Brian Weezer very shortly. And Jeffries, Brent Phil. All of that around the corner in the market right now. We're about eight minutes away from the cash open in New York City. The future's soft on the S&P 500. Futures are a whole lot softer on the NASDAQ as well, off the back of that Facebook story. In a bottom
bond market will shape up as follows in Treasuries yield. Look a little something like this. A little bit with the euro lower by two basis points at 295. And a touch of dollar strength against the weaker euro following that news conference with euro dollar south of 117 at 116.96. From New York for our audience worldwide, good morning to you. This is the Red TV. dramatic compared to the drama elsewhere taking a look at facebook and looking at nasdaq futures that's where the real pain is at the moment the read across there isn't much of it not much contagion that's a conversation for later on in the program i want to take the opportunity now to whip through some morning calls and look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations beginning with a call first up from keybank reiterating its overweight rating on 160 dollar price target on visa the analyst saying the company reported a solid beat and coming up later more on visa with my interview with the CFO, Vassar Krabu, that's coming up just around the corner. Next up, the second call coming from Cowan, defending American Airlines after the company cut its earnings out for a second time. The yeah, they're saying the airline's conservative approach to capacity should be viewed favorably. Their stocks go down by 1.31%. And finally, Baird maintaining its outperform rating on Tesla ahead of quarterly earnings. The analyst saying the company's ability to generate free cash flow may be underappreciated. That is another stock, though, that is still in a little bit of a pain zone. We're down by 1.28% in the free market. To get you set up for the scores ahead of the cash open, we are set up as follows. A read through with futures negative two tenths of 1% on S&P 500 futures. Dow futures positive. These kind of reads are all over the place with NASDAQ futures weighed heavily lower by what is happening with Facebook. Cross asset the picture looking like this. Treasury yields at the moment coming through down by two basis points at 295. Euro dollar a little bit softer here. A whole lot softer is Facebook. That is the headline ahead of the cash open from New York. This is from New York. This is Bloomberg.
25 seconds away from the cash open this morning. Good morning to you with futures all over the place, and I'll explain why. Dow futures positive two tenths of one percent. A lot of positive earnings in the mix there. A lot of negative earnings in the mix on Nasdaq futures with Facebook front and centre, bringing Nasdaq futures down by three quarters of one percent. And S and P 500 futures just a little bit lighter, We're up by four points and down by just over a tenth of one percent. As you hit the opening bell ring in New York City, switch up the board and the bond market a bit comes through. Yields are by two basis points to 295 on a US 10 year. The euro just a little bit weaker here. The dollar coming some strength against most of G10 through the day. The euro dollar now well south, comfortably south of 117 at 116.77, down four tenths of 1%. And with that dollar strength, just a touch of crude weakness. 69 on WTI and down by four tenths of 1%. So many movers out there. Let's get straight to them and cross over to Julie Hyman. Jules. Yeah, John, we're in the we didn't start the fire portion of the earnings season where I just rattle off as many as possible because it's so busy. Let's talk about the payment companies. PayPal disappointing investors. Uh, the company's third quarter outlook below what they had been predicting and Venmo growth is slowing. Uh, this, of course, just as we got that new investment from uh, Dan Loeb and he touted the stock but it's down today by nearly 3%. MasterCard and Visa also disappointing on volumes in particular. Part of that having to do with the strong